Thank you so much. Well, listen, thank you very, very much, and I'm glad you're here since he's also an intern with us uh, at Gingrich Productions, so we're delighted to have him uh, here today to, co to cover the things that we talk about at Gingrich Productions. I uh, am delighted to have a chance to talk with you. I think that the Young America's Foundation plays a very important role. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you a question, just, just as a test case, for those of you who are students at the present time. How many of you would say that there is a liberal bias on your campus? <laughs> I'm sure. No, I'm really curious. Uh, is there anybody here um, who would say there's not a liberal bias? Where do you go? College of the Arts. College of, oh, that's a great school. I really like that school. Where else? Okay, else there. Uh, Mississippi State University. Good. That's the largest school I've heard from that doesn't have a bias. Uh, that's great. Well, you, I think anybody watching this will have some sense of what this is all about and why Young America's Foundation matters. We are part of the reason I wrote uh, Trump's America is that we are in a long-term struggle that is literally a cultural civil war. And those of you who are right now in the middle of uh, classes where, how many of you have a professor who if you gave a directly conservative answer on your test would give you a lower grade? Do any of you, raise your hand if, you have, if you've had professors who would literally mark you down you know, as a form of you know, giving the wrong answer by definition. Um, I think that the, if you look at the, the news media is really an outsource of the, of the universities. So as the universities became more liberal, the news media followed that pattern. And that's why you end up uh, with the kind of news media that we have today. Although the intensity as it relates to Trump, I think, is different. Um, how, how, and this I'll, I'll include the, the, uh, the, the post-student group also in this. How, <clears throat> how, how many of you on election day in 2016 uh, thought Hillary would probably win? Just raise your hand. Okay. Now, this is a conservative audience, and yet 90% of the hands went up. How, how many of you were confident Trump would win? One, okay, two, right, about three of you. So, so I'm going to start, and this is part of why I wrote Trump's America, because I'd, I'd written last year a book called Understanding Trump, which um, really was because he's so different that there were all sorts of people coming up to me saying, you know, I, I don't understand what he's doing. I don't understand how he does it. And so that book really focused on Trump. And I think it, had, frankly, uh, weathered pretty well over the last year. I think if you read it now, it still has, it's, it's very relevant because he's, large parts of who he is haven't changed. But I realized as I watched what was going on that a great deal of what we're living through isn't Trump as a personality, but it's things that are happening in America. And that you have to look at the larger picture of the, of the America that Trump is president of in order to fully understand the Trump presidency. And that, that's why Trump's America is different. And I have a theory about why the left is so hostile. And it goes back to election day. Think about all of your friends who are liberals, who about 8 o'clock on election evening were about to pop the champagne. Hillary was going to break the glass ceiling. They were going to get a left-wing Supreme Court justice. Uh, they were going to have policies on the left. They were going to have weakness overseas. They were going to raise taxes. You know, life was good. And two hours later, and some of you may have lived through this, may have seen it in, 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 in whatever room you were in that night. Two hours later, they're suddenly staring at each other, beginning to realize that not only is she not going to be president, but that means that Donald J. Trump is going to be president. And I believe what happened was a traumatic event comparable to a psychosis. That the intensity and speed of the change was so great that most liberals today suffer from a political variance of PTSD. <laughs> and the, the part of Trump's genius is he tweets every morning. And so these people who go to bed and, and they, they, they spend the night trying not to think of the nightmare that is occurring, and they wake up in the morning and they're about to begin a happy new day, and they see a Trump tweet and they suddenly realize, oh my God, he's still president. 
And so they, they, can't, they can't get over it. It's like watching Groundhog Day as a political film. Uh, and they just come back to it again and again and again. And that's a big part of why you have this, this extraordinary level of anger. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to say we're political opponents or we're ideological opponents. But there is a deep personal part of this. And it's because, you know, he, almost like in the Middle Ages, he's a guy who usurped the kingship. I mean, you have a usurper now sitting in the White House who does, shouldn't, liter, shouldn't be there legitimately. Well, Trump, of course, basically ignores all that. Uh, and, and what people don't really appreciate about him is Trump grew up in the New York media market, which is the toughest, nastiest, most competitive media market in the country. And Trump learned by 1985 or so that if he was willing to fight, he would get coverage every day. And Trump likes coverage. So he has spent the last 33 years fighting. And when people say, oh, is he going to get worn out? No. He wakes up in the morning looking for a fight. <laughs> he enjoys it. He gains energy from it. And so that's part of why you have this noise level up here. But, but under the noise level, there are huge things happening. I mean, a couple examples that are obvious. We now have the lowest black unemployment rate in American history. Now, you'd think liberals would be thrilled. Because after all, this means that, that in, a, in a group who they express deep concern for, there are now more job opportunities than ever. In fact, two days ago, there was a report that came out that said there are now more vacancies than there are people looking for work. Now, you would think that's good. Um, the Federal Reserve in Atlanta estimates that this quarter, the economy is going to grow at 4.8%. If that happens, that's not only more than twice as fast as ever under Obama, but that begins to move back into the Reagan range of having a boom. And part of what that's signaling, I talked last night to Steve Miller at the Heritage Foundation, he's a very, very good professional economist, who said the size of the investment structure that's coming down the road, the number of companies that are now investing is stunning. I was with a Canadian firm two weeks ago. And they said virtually every company in Canada is looking at moving people to the United States because the new tax code makes us the most competitive country in the world. So you're better off tax-wise to be here than anywhere else in the world, which is an enormous shift, which means you're going to see a huge amount of money coming into the U.S. to build factories and create jobs and found companies. At the same time, you have the deregulation process the Trump team have deregulated, cut red tape, more than all the other presidents since World War II combined. And what does that do? Well, it liberates businesses to invest. Well, the, you actually were seeing the economy start to take off before the tax cuts because the deregulation process was sending signals that said, you ought to go out and, and increase your business, hire more people, do more things. Government's not going to harass you. And, and, uh, and try to put you out of business. And so they're already starting down the road that's changing. But it's not, notice the book's not called Trump's government, it's called Trump's America. And the reason for that is there are very interesting things happening outside of government that are actually going to compel dramatic change in government. Now my favorite, we have a whole chapter on uh, space because I really have, I'm passionate about space. I think it's, it is, in fact, I think our future. I mean, I'm curious, how many of you would be interested if there was a, an opportunity uh, to go into space? How many of you would actually be willing to do it? Just raise your hand. I'm just curious. There's a, you know, there's the, the people talk about risk. We lose 15 people a year at Yosemite because they go hiking on these various trails. And there are, I think, 200 people now on Mount Everest who are frozen that they can't get off. Um, because you climb Mount Everest, it's dangerous. And yet every year, people show up. Lots of people show up at Yosemite, but people also show up at Everest. So what you have is that we're right at the opening stages of moving from space as a very rare thing done by a very small number of very specialized people to space as a zone of pioneering and colonization. And again, a large part of it is not, and this is where Trump as an entrepreneur fits in, but it's not government per se. Uh, there's a book called Space Barons I recommend to all of you, right after, of course, you finish reading Trump's America. Uh, but Space Barons is fascinating because it takes four billionaires. And, and we've really not adjusted yet to the fact 
that there are people on this planet who are wealthy enough that they're the equivalent of a country, that they have that many assets. So in a way, the most ephemeral of space barons is Richard Branson, uh, who runs Virgin America, ran Virgin America, which has now been sold, but Virgin Atlantic and others. Uh, he has a firm called Virgin Galactic. They've now, they have a spaceship too, uh, and it's now successfully completed two flights. And it is designed to take six passengers and a uh, pilot and co-pilot up to about 60 miles, which is right at, literally at the edge of space. So you would, you would ride up in it, and you'd have about 15 minutes of being weightless and taking pictures of the Earth as seen from 60 miles up. Um, and he's put a fair amount of money into this thing. He has hundreds of people who have put down $250,000 uh, to reserve a seat on one of his flights. Uh, the second person who's doing this is Paul Allen. Now, Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft. He's worth about $46 billion. Uh, and Allen decided to go a totally different route. Uh, he is building a, the largest airplane in the world, basically two 747s that are, that are joined together at the middle. And it's designed to carry a rocket up to about 50,000 feet and then launch it. And his goal is to make going into space about the same convenience as getting on a domestic airliner. So you literally would call ahead and say, gee, I'd like to go up Thursday at 2 o'clock. And you just go do it. And, and you wouldn't have to go through training, and you wouldn't go you know, down to, to, to Houston. And so again, that, that's a near space example. The third example is Elon Musk, who is a South African who's become an American, uh, who invented Tesla. He's done all sorts of things. Uh, and um, one of his projects is called SpaceX. And SpaceX, and, and he says openly, publicly, his goal is to colonize Mars, um, which again is very different from the NASA model. The NASA model is to have a handful of astronauts who are exquisitely trained go visit Mars for a little bit. Uh, he's talking about lots of people like us just showing up one morning as pioneers. So he's, and he figured out early on that the biggest single problem with getting to space was cost. And the biggest problem with cost was simple. You use rockets once. Well, imagine if every time you took off in an airplane, it was the only flight that airplane would make, how expensive commercial flying would be. Because, of course, you reduce cost radically the more often you use it. So he has been designing his rockets so that they will take off and then return. And some of you may have seen the YouTube video of the two rockets that look like a ballet. The two, the, 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 they, they come back down parallel to each other and land. And his goal is to have every rocket used at least 10 times. Well, he, he will take at least 40% out of the cost of getting into space. And so suddenly, you have a different cost structure. You can do different things. You have different opportunities. But the person who is the real example of the Wright brothers and Henry Ford uh, is Jeff Bezos. Bezos has been a space fanatic since he was about 12 years old. He got rich for the purpose of going into space. Uh, Amazon worked probably better than expected it would. Uh, he's now the wealthiest man in the world, at least for the present. So I, I, I sat with Bezos a couple months ago. He writes a personal check for a billion dollars every year. And no federal hearings, no government regulations, no congressional investigations, just he hires engineers. No long-term planning, none, none of the NASA bureaucracy. He just hires engineers. By either next year or the year after, they will have a rocket called the John Glenn, which is a heavy lift rocket, which is reusable, which will literally put 5,500 pounds into space. And then the rocket will come back down, get refueled, take another 5,500 pounds into space. And their goal is to be able to do it every day. That is, one, one flight per day per rocket. Uh, this is a revolution in capabilities. And it's, the reason I use this example is it's happening around the government, not because the government. I mean, NASA provides certain facilities. NASA's had a long track record and has a big institutional memory. But the truth is, these four entrepreneurs are just doing it. They're not asking permission. They're not sitting around for long planning sessions. Uh, they have varying levels of government support. Musk has gotten the most government support. But <clears throat> excuse me, this is what you see happening everywhere. There's a, there's a firm you can look up called Udacity. 
It's, a, it's Audacity without the A. Udacity is an online learning system that was invented by the guy Sebastian Thrun, <coughs> forgive me, who uh, invented uh, the Google self-driving car and invented Google's uh, Earthview and taught at Stanford and offered a course on advanced computing and offered it online. And he had 400 students who were registered at Stanford and 53,000 people who signed up online, which frankly made the Stanford faculty pretty mad because they weren't paying tuition. Uh, of the, a considerable number of them finished the course. When he did the final, the top Stanford student was number 400 in the final exam. There were 399 other people online who did better. And he said he had this very sobering realization that as much as he liked his lectures, they weren't the most effective way to learn. That the most effective way was to actually have a relationship where you could ask the computer over and over if you didn't get it, because the computer never got bored. It's very, very hard. I don't know how many of you ever tried this? It's very hard to ask a professor three, four, five times the same question, because you just you, you get intimidated by yourself. And even if the professor's willing to, you're not willing to. But the computer doesn't care. And so he thought this, he wanted to go out and experiment with it. So he, he built Udacity, uh, which is an online learning system, and promptly found that the University of California faculty hated it because it was a threat. I mean, you have, we, I once wrote a book, the, the subtitle was Pioneers of the Future and Prison Guards of the Past. Because you have to remember, every one of these things, it's like the Transcontinental Railroad versus the stagecoach. I mean, whoever was the last cycle doesn't get all that excited when the next cycle starts to make them obsolete. So he had the courage when, when they literally said, you could not offer his material in the University of California system. And so he said, fine, I'm not even going to try to get accredited. And he started signing contracts with places like Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, that if you take his courses and you pass them for the purpose of hiring you, they're certified by those companies. And he's discovered that there's an amazing number of people who say, let me get this straight. I can get a normal degree, or I can get a degree that Google recognizes for the purpose of hiring me. I think I'll try that. And so, again, it's an example of the beginning of the future. Of, of a, because if we're going to go through artificial intelligence and we're going to go through robotics, uh, we're going to have so many jobs where people need to be re-educated that we need to think of new and creative and better ways of learning so people can continuously upgrade their marketable skills. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. So from my perspective, you see lots of changes coming down the road. There, there are 90 drugs currently in process for dealing with Alzheimer's. Now, none of them work yet, and they're all, but they're all, there are 90 different efforts to develop something. And Alzheimer's is the biggest public health cost we have. It's about $20 trillion between now and 2050, the equivalent of the entire national debt. Uh, so it's a huge area we're going to break through. It's a very serious effort underway uh, to develop a non-addictive painkiller. So you could literally replace all of the opioids by having a painkiller that was effective that, didn't, that had no addiction. And that probably will come online in two or three years because we have a pretty good understanding of the biology of doing that. But I look around and I see all of these kind of opportunities coming down the road. And then you see the left. And the left's goal is control. Whether it is a government-run health system, it's a government-run school system, you go down the whole list. And I think from the left standpoint, the world I'm describing to you is not a happy, fun, exciting, optimistic world. It's a terrifying world. I mean, what if people just got to go out and be happy? And what if they didn't really need the bureaucracy? And what if they could go out and find a job? And they didn't really have to have somebody give them food stamps? And so in a sense, the whole Trumpian worldview of can we grow fast enough, create enough new jobs, build a big enough system, is, is really very threatening if you're the left. And, and secondly, the idea of making America great again by applying it to everybody. Uh, so that you end up with any American of any background having an opportunity to pursue happiness and rise, which violates the left's model, 
which is we should not be considered as individuals. The, left, the left's model is all of you should be broken up into groups. And we should then decide what group you should belong to and which group you should be mad at. And so it's a real model of divisiveness and a real model of, of uh, taking the country apart, not putting the country back together. And those two competitions are going to be very impressive, I think. In, in Texas, uh, the poll just came out last week. Senator Cruz now is actually carrying the Latino vote against a Hispanic Democrat. Uh, Governor Abbott is tied with the, with the Latino vote. Uh, both of them get much higher percentage of the African-American vote than they would have gotten four years ago. Because again, if you have the lowest black unemployment rate in history, people talk to each other. And they start saying, gee, what if this is just working? Maybe it's a good idea. And so there are a lot of things going on that, that really represent a profound change. Let me talk about one last area. I apologize, my throat gets dry. Um, and that's understanding Trump both in trade and foreign policy. I think it is very funny that the Europeans and the Canadians, have, and I have no idea how the meeting's going to go today, but they've decided at the, at the, at the uh, G7 that they're going to gang up on Trump. Now, it's funny, first of all, because the fastest growing economy in the G7 is the United States. So you, you might think, this happened to Reagan, by the way. When Reagan first went to his very first meeting with all these guys, they basically treated him like this kid who didn't know what he was doing. And he just sat in the corner. When he came back two years later, we had the fastest growing economy in the world. And suddenly, he, they wanted him at the center of the stage. So let, let's, let's just start with that. The fastest growing economy by a big margin is the United States. So you might think that the other leaders might say to him, gee, Donald, what are you doing right? Instead, they're mad at him because he pulled out of the Paris Agreement on, on the environment, and he's pulled out of the Iranian Agreement, and he's involved in the tariff war. And I, and I noticed uh, you know, Trudeau and, and Macron both picked a fight with him, and he came right back at him. He pointed out, for example, that I think the Canadians have 147% tariff on American farm goods. And he said, you know, you want, I mean, you want to pick a fight? I mean, first of all, the Canadian economy depends on us very heavily. Uh, so in the long run, they can get irritated with us, but they can't fight us. But in the case of Macron, you know, the French economy still underperforms. It has very high youth unemployment. And Macron, who, who in some ways is a lot like Trump, I mean, Macron has tried very hard to reform France. And he's having a very hard time doing it, even though he has absolute control of the National Assembly. Because the truth is, the French people aren't that excited about being reformed. I mean, they have a very long history of the, 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 the railroad workers have been striking two days a week for months just to send a signal we're not happy. And we imagine the chaos that causes. And so, you know, they're not necessarily the people who are in a very good position to come and decide they will lecture us on the economy. But in addition, Trump understood something very profound. From World War II until 2016, we used the American economy to prop up worldwide alliances. So if we needed your help, somehow you got a good deal. And for a very long time, it made perfect sense, one, because the Soviet Union was our major competitor, and two, because when we came out of World War II, we were half the world's economy. Remember, everybody else had been bombed. And we were the one country that had not suffered any significant wartime damage. So we, we were a huge portion of the world, and we could afford to be generous. Well, over the last 25 years, that's all disappeared. Um, we, had, we had agreed to work with the Chinese and to let them into the World Trade Organization on the hopes that they would then become part of a rule-based modern system. And they're not. Uh, the director of national intelligence under Obama, not under Trump, said two years ago that the Chinese stole $460 billion in intellectual property in one year. That's more than our total sales to China. And so Trump has taken the position that we're going to defend our, pro our intellectual property. Well, that's going to lead to friction. He's taking the position that <clears throat> we have a 2.5% tariff on cars, the Chinese have a 25% tariff on cars. He said, we're not, you know, we're not going to play a game where you charge 10 times as much as we do. 
And so that's going to lead to friction. And people need to understand that. If you have an American president who puts America first instead of putting some kind of vague world global system first, that's going to create tension. First, because it's a huge change from what they're used to dealing with. And second, because as the biggest country in the world, if we put ourselves first, we're, we're formidable. We're a little bit frightening. Because nobody else, even the Chinese, as much as they've grown, cannot possibly compete with us in a head-to-head -head contest right now. They might be able to in 30, 40, 50 years. They can't right now. And if we go back to growing at 4% a year or more, they're not going to catch up in your lifetime. So these are the kind of changes that are underway that are amazing. Lastly, Trump has, and I wrote about this some in Understanding Trump and a lot more in Trump's America, Trump has a deep belief in his ability to learn and his ability to negotiate. And one of the things that, that, that I think people in the Washington press corps don't get that makes him different, he listens to everybody. So when he was in Saudi Arabia, the king of Saudi Arabia was with him. Every, they were there for three days. And every time they were in public, the king of Saudi Arabia was next to him. And they were talking. And Trump's listening. It's not just transactional, you know, uh, did you have a nice dessert yesterday? But it's kind of, and, and he does this all day, every day. I mean, he picks people's brains. He listens to them. He listens to them in ways where sometimes he'll be talking, but he'll be watching how you react. And he'll be feeding back information about, well, that worked, that didn't work, that's strong, that's not strong. Uh, and he has enormous levels of energy. So the traditional model, which is, um, I wonder what we should do about X leading to five really bright staffers, you know, three from the Brookings Institution and two from the American Enterprise Institution, writing a paper so that they all feel important and fighting over the paper for seven weeks and finally giving the president a paper. His answer is, I think I'll call the president of South Korea. I think I'll call the president of China. I think I'll talk to the prime minister of Japan uh, and see how it feels. So the volume of information he takes in is astonishing. And his willingness to be tough is astonishing. I mean, this is not a guy who's afraid. Uh, and it's not necessarily that he has courage. Uh, John Paul II uh, used to say, be not afraid. He didn't say have courage. And Trump operates a lot like that. So uh, I have no idea what's going to happen in Singapore. I think it is possible that they will have a very successful meeting. I think it is also possible that that morning, about breakfast time, uh, they'll decide it ain't going to work and they'll walk out. And I think that's the range of options. Clist and I did a movie uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, that, that we shot part of it at the ranch uh, called uh, Rendezvous with Destiny. It's a life of Ronald Reagan. And then we went to, to uh, Reykjavik a couple years ago in Iceland. And there's this little house where Reagan and Gorbachev met in 1987. And there's this great scene that we had in the movie that was, you know, straight out of the newsreels, where Reagan, Reagan was, was holding out for missile defense. Gorbachev was offering him everything. You know, we, we can have arms limitations, we can have this treaty, and we can have that treaty, but you've got to give up your missile defense. And Reagan kept saying, no, I'm not doing it. So Gorbachev said, well, I'm not going to give you anything. And Reagan said, well, yeah, that's fine, but I'm not doing it. So it breaks down, they walk outside, and there's this great scene where Reagan, who's not, not normally this aggressive, is literally in Gorbachev's face, poking him and saying, you did this, you made a mistake, you screwed up, you're gonna regret this. And it's clear that Reagan's really angry. Well, I was in Congress at the time, and all of the regular Republican sophisticated people came back and said, oh, this was a terrible mistake. Uh, was, you know, he, he had such a good deal. All he had to do was give up that stupid missile defense thing. Six months later, Gorbachev came to Washington, agreed to every single thing Reagan wanted, and gave up on trying to stop missile defense. I think Trump understands that model, that if you're the most powerful nation in the world, and you're the one applying sanctions, and you're the one who can bring economic pressure to bear, you actually don't have to say yes. It's the other guy who has a problem. And so it'll be very interesting to see how he negotiates with Kim Jong-un next week. So let me, how about if I just toss it open for questions? You're all practicing to 
be journalists, here's a chance to be journalists. Yes. Um, I wonder. Hold on, they're going to rush up with microphones. It's going to become an exciting moment here. So, Come on, one of you, here we go. You have your first victim right here. Mm -mm. You walk by him. That's right. Tell. <laughs> you have to be more assertive, like you grab him when he walks past you. I wonder with um, many of the entrepreneurs you've mentioned, Paul Allen, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, um, they found a lot of their success in the previous eight years of the Obama administration. So I wonder um, how that correlates to Trump's America. Well, they found it because they were in zones that uh, the government hadn't been able to screw up yet. I mean, I, I, would, I would argue that, uh, you know, mo most of America is still relatively healthy, despite big government, but that the impact of large government the, and the impact of high taxes slowed everything down. I think had, had they had the current regulatory environment and the current tax environment, we'd probably be 50% further down the road than we are right now. Okay, right here, this, this, and then we'll come back over there. So when I talk to people about how black unemployment is at its lowest time in history, a common response I hear is, well, that's not Trump's doing, that was Obama's doing. So sure. um, what, how, do, how do you, would you retort that? All I would say is it's astonishing that we had eight years where they never once got the, the growth rate above 2%. We were being told it was impossible to get to 3%. We were told that if Trump was elected, there would be a depression. And we were told that we should get used to the new normal. When you go back, just, just, just put in new normal and, 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 and search in your search engine and see how many left-wing economists show up saying, you know, people shouldn't be complaining. So I, I was actually struck with this because I, I, I first won office when Jimmy Carter was president. And we had a really slow period of economic growth with a really high inflation rate. And Carter went on TV one night and gave what became known as the malaise speech, although he actually never used the word malaise. But the essence of it was, you know, we all feel miserable because we're miserable and it's our own fault. And all of you who are miserable, I blame you. <laughs> and the country thought about it. And Ronald Reagan had this line he used in the campaign. And he said, um, a recession is when your brother-in-law is unemployed. A depression is when you're unemployed. A recovery is when Jimmy Carter's unemployed. Uh, and that was one of his themes. And it's, it's very eerily similar. I mean, they, the left had convinced themselves that, the, that Carter had the best economy you could get. And within a year and a half of Reagan taking office, we began to explosively change everything. Well, you're seeing the same thing here. I mean, I, I think it's very hard to make the argument that you could say, look, we'd still be at 2% growth, and, he, and, and, and Obama did bring us out with a long period of 1% or 2% growth. Fine. So what's the difference in revenue and what's the difference in job creation between 2% growth and what's currently happening? And Trump claims that he's added $7 trillion, or that his policies have added $7 trillion, although being Trump, he wouldn't, he wouldn't qualify it with policies because it's so much more fun to say, I added $7 trillion. And next month, I'm adding five more. Uh, just a style he has, which I think he learned very early on as an entrepreneur and as a, as a showman, as a marketer. Um, but I think it's going to be very hard to argue if, the, if this continues. Now, again, we've got a lot of things to do to make this continue. But if it continues, what, I think what you're going to see is the Kanye West reaction, which is, at what point do I get to tell you I think that's baloney? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident that if, that if they work out an agreement in Singapore and they walk out front and they announce that the North Koreans are giving up all of their nuclear weapons by Wednesday evening, the New York Times headline will be uh, dramatic effort by heroic Kim Jong-un despite Trump's personality. <laughs> Okay, back there. You had somebody right there, I thought. Real Greenspan, Western New England University. In I'm sorry, what? Oh, no. Okay. You have to hold it close. Okay. Gabriel Greenspan, uh, Western New England University in Springfield, Mass. I was just wondering, so if you look at President Trump's background, 
Um, he's actually been fairly liberal on a lot of issues in the past. He used to be pro-choice on the abortion question. He used to be in favor of socialized medicine. I believe after the 2012 presidential election, he actually accused Mitt Romney of being too conservative or quote-unquote heartless on immigration. And yet now you look at Trump's presidency. He's a staunchly pro-life, anti-illegal immigration president who wants to overturn Obamacare. Um, what do you think accounts for this change in policy and change in, uh, I guess, political direction on President Trump's part? Yeah, well, I, I always tell people, I mean, Trump is not a conservative. If, if you mean Barry Goldwater, Ronald Reagan, William Buckley, what Trump is, is he's the most effective anti-liberal in American history. But it's not because he's conservative, it's because he applies common sense. And so much of modern liberalism is nuts that if you actually apply common sense, it just falls apart. So I, I, I take seriously the story he tells about the woman that he got to know who had been advised to have an abortion and her daughter was with her as she was telling him the story and that that, that was the decisive moment. So I, I, I give him that one, all right? There's also a story out this morning that he would contemplate legalizing marijuana. I mean, you can't assume that, that Trump is going to walk in the room having spent 30 years thinking this stuff through. Reagan became, Reagan originally was an FDR Democrat. And actually, as late as 1948, made commercials for Harry Truman and for Hubert Humphrey, when Hubert Humphrey was the anti-communist liberal running against the pro-communist liberal in Minnesota. We tend to forget just how bad that period was. Uh, and Reagan became an anti-communist. And then when he, when he married Nancy, her father was a very right-wing medical doctor. Uh, and gradually, through a series of conversations, Reagan began to be more and more anti-tax. And then he was hired by General Electric, a wonderful book all of you should read, uh, called The Education of Ronald Reagan, which, which I recommend very highly. It's a very short book. And it's about the time, he, the eight years he spent at General Electric. And he had as a mentor the head of government relations at General Electric. I, I actually, I'd worked with Reagan for years. When I read this book, I understood what he was doing for the first time. It was, it's that decisive a book. And he learned from this guy how you deal with people. He went around the country and gave 375 speeches um, to blue-collar audiences with uh, Q&A and with picture-taking. So by the time he ran for president, he'd been interacting with blue-collar workers, talking about ideas. But the, but the guy who had hired him was a very conservative person, uh, and Reagan wouldn't fly back then. From 1946 to 1965, Reagan refused to fly. He'd got, he had a very bad airplane flight. Uh, I think they got caught in a thunderstorm, and he just decided that was it. And in fact, he didn't fly again until in the fall of 1965, he gets a call one evening from his brother in San Francisco, who says, you know, Ronnie, there are a group of guys who would like to have breakfast with you in the morning and talk about supporting you for governor. And he said, well, I mean, you know I, I don't fly and I can't get from here to San Francisco that fast. And he said, well, you get to decide if you want to be governor, I'll be at breakfast, and hung up on him wouldn't, and wouldn't take the call. Next morning, Reagan goes out for the first time in 20 years, gets in an airplane, which told you how ambitious he was. But for the period he's working for General Electric for eight years, he's riding, he's riding a train. And he didn't, he didn't gamble, and, you know, and he read books. And this guy keeps giving him conservative books. Hayek, for example, Friedman. So Reagan is reading conservative economics all this period. Trump didn't do any of that. Trump made money, invented new things like The Apprentice and you know, the best-selling tie in America, and golfed. I mean, he doesn't drink. And, I mean, it's not like he was hanging around, you know, being wasteful, just... He's a guy, he's a business guy. He's not a politician. But, it, but the, the gap in how badly run the country was and his own ego sense that he could do a better job than anybody else because he got up that morning and thought, I'm Donald J. Trump. <laughs> of course I could do a better job. Otherwise, it wouldn't be Donald J. Trump. Um, <laughs> and that's what propels him. So I, I, don't, I don't hold him to any kind of automatic ideological checklist. What I will say, though, is when he makes a decision, there's a real difference. So there, there's, it's almost like there are two Trumps. When it's a big decision, the, the Iran agreement, which for two and a half years he said was a bad deal. And I had Europeans approaching me 
just before he finally ended the agreement. And they said, what can we do? What can we do? And I said, you know, you either come up with a better deal or he's going to kill it. I mean, he's been telling you this for two and a half. You've had two and a half years here. It's not a, like a secret. Uh, cutting taxes. He's very stable. Deregulation. Conservative judges. Now, when you get down to little things, he is totally unpredictable. And, you, I mean, he couldn't predict himself because he, 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 he's basically a free spirit on small things. Uh, and I think you have to see him that way. But I think your observation is exactly right. The, the Trump, Trump evolved... I mean, it's a very interesting question because Trump evolved in part in response to an evolving reality and he evolved in part in response to running as a Republican populist in a field of, with 16 other people. And over time, I think he, that he realized if he was going to put together a base that wasn't just personality, then he had to have a frame of reference that enabled him to appeal to this large block of people. And I think that the, the two came together way over here. Okay, uh, except somebody's got to, one of you has to go all the way over here. No, no. I know it's a, it's a tricky. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Nolan Meyer. Um, I actually met for dinner with former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster the other night, and he wanted me to send my regards to you. Um, my question is, um, you know, when you were a Speaker of the House, you wrote the contract with America. Uh, you seem to have an uncanny ability to work with President Clinton and get things done. Uh, fast forward 20 years later, and it kind of seems like Congress is in a perpetual state of gridlock. Um, what changes do you think we can make to get out of this? And do you think this is an issue of incompetence or partis partisanship? Well, I think, first of all, we're not in a perpetual state of gridlock. I mean, they passed the largest tax cut in American history. Uh, they passed a number of other bills. Uh, but there's a very deep partisan divide. And I think there are at least two parts to what's going on. One is the, the gap between the right and the left is much bigger. As I, as I describe in, in uh, Trump's America, I actually think we're in the middle of a cultural civil war. And I mean that literally. So th these are profound differences about the nature of America. And uh, I think that makes it a real challenge. Uh, second, I think um, you have to have a personality you can deal with. <clears throat> I personally would have had no idea how to deal with Barack Obama because I think, I think he, was, he was opaque. You know, Barack Obama got up every morning knowing that the brightest person on the planet had just gotten up. And he spent all day with, with the brightest person on the planet, which was him. Uh, and he would treat you with contempt. Um, and unless, and there was no way to break through. I mean, I think, uh, and I, and I've talked to, to Boehner when he was speaker. I talked to Ryan when he was speaker. I, I, if I had been speaker, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, because I think Obama, by personality, was so hard to deal with. But I mean, Clinton, Clinton, for all of his weaknesses, is an astonishingly open human being. And <clears throat> you, could, you could talk with Bill. I mean, now, about a third of the time, he'd lie. But you, you just got used to that. I mean, it was just part of the process. Uh, and, and you could figure out after a while which ones were true and which ones weren't, uh, often by later on which ones happened and which ones didn't. Uh, but he was, but even, even when, even when I remember we had a couple occasions that were very, very angry. Uh, the next day you go back at it again. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. This, this is the business you're in. Um, I think the other part of that is, it, I mean, the Democrats right now don't want to work with Trump. They're, their goal was for Trump to fail. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted that <clears throat> McConnell's now going to keep the Senate in in August. He should, I think he should have done this earlier, uh, and I think they'll cave. But, but they clearly have no interest in being cooperative, and that particularly on, on, on either the Senate or House leadership. Um, and in that case, you just run over them. You don't worry about it too much. Uh, but what I would have done more of is, I w it goes back to Reagan, I would have figured out issues that made it very expensive for the Democrats to stay unified. And I bring up issues in such a way that, that the Democratic leadership was constantly under pressure because about a third of its members were saying, I can't, I can't stay with you. And I'll, I'll get beat back home if I vote with you. And, and that's the kind of pressure that breaks apart that kind of partisanship. And then frankly, with Trump, I think you just have to be endlessly patient. I mean, if I were a legislative leader today, I would recognize that, you know, you have to spend a lot of time with him. You have to listen to him a lot. 
Uh, you have to try to sort through what you're going to try to get done. And you have to have a, a little, you have to wear a seatbelt because every once in a while he'll do something you didn't expect that he didn't expect and he won't have called you to tell you he was going to do it. And so you need a seatbelt just to get through the, 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 the car wreck. Okay, I see, right there. Um, Fernando, University of Florida. Uh, I don't know if you have, but um, you were talking about how uh, deregulated the um, um, the government's um, been going. Um, how do you see um, this government being deregulating or shrinking um, in the next couple of years? Well, I think let's stay with deregulated first. I think they will continue the pressure to reduce the total number of regulations. And I think that they uh, will continue to try to find every possible way to, to make government leaner and faster and more efficient. Um, I suspect they will do some attrition by just, just not filling slots as people retire. But you, you have to handle that pretty carefully because you know, if, you, if, you, if you're in the middle of a cancer research project at, at, at the National Institutes of Health, you don't want a firing freeze to mean you can't find two more cancer researchers. So I think that's tricky. But my guess is that the government will be somewhat smaller by the time they're done, uh, with the exception that they're expanding homeland security and they're expanding uh, the defense system. And that'll con I think that'll continue. And I think given the rise of a more dangerous world, they really won't have any choice. They'll, they'll have to invest more in defense. Yes, ma'am. Right here, right in the middle. Hi, uh, Joanna Beckler with Lee University. Um, my question is, we are, you know, about halfway through Trump's first uh, term. There's still a substantial amount of his first term as president left. Where do you see the economy going in this, you know, second phase of his presidency? Yeah, but the, actually I divided um, Trump's America into two parts. The first half is what we've accomplished up till now, and the second half is what we have to do <coughs> The challenge we have to meet. I think if he continues down the road um, of deregulation, if they continue to um, be very tough in trade negotiations, that the economy will continue to grow pretty dramatically. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked to have three and a half or four or four and a half percent real growth over the next for the next three or four or five years. Some, somebody had a great line. It may have been uh, uh, Steve Moore last night, but somebody said. This, this will be a great minor project for somebody here who's good at math. If you assume that the American economy historically for 200 years averages over 3%, we actually, actually average close to 3.5% growth a year, compounded. And you look at the last two years of Bush and the eight years of Obama, even though we were sort of slowly recovering, we're recovering at a rate below the historic glide slope. So if you figured out on a compounded basis, if we had stayed at 3.5%, what would the economy look like today? It gives you the gap that we can grow into. So when people tell you, oh, we're really close to the end because after all, we can't grow much more. Well, no, actually by historic standards, you know, we're probably 15 or 20% smaller than we would have been if we'd grown consistently at 3.5%. So you could, this is what happened with Reagan. I mean, the, the last three years of Reagan, we were growing unbelievably fast. And I think if Bush had not uh, come out for a tax increase, uh, that we would continue, we would have continued to grow all through uh, the, the early 90s. And in a bizarre way, it was Bush coming out for a tax increase, splitting the Republican Party, and slowing down the economy, which both helped elect uh, Bill Clinton and then helped elect the first Republican House in 40 years. Yes, ma'am. Juliana Knott, Calvin College. Uh, you talked earlier about how the age of artificial intelligence, like the American workforce, is going to have to be a lot more agile in response to it. What steps do we have to take in order to become more agile? I think a couple things. Let me point out, first of all, if you went back to, say, 1800, you would have a substantial number of people actually engaged in fur trapping. Uh, you would have overwhelmingly the majority of the population engaged in farming. 
Uh, and if you had said to them, we're going to be down to, I don't know what the current number is, but I think somebody here may actually know the real number. I think it's like 3.5 or 4% of the country is farming, and we produce a massive surplus, which we have to sell somewhere uh, because we just our farmers are just so productive. Um, the average person in 1800 would have thought you were crazy. Well, I think the same thing's true today. I mean, I, I, humans have a knack of inventing the next cycle of desirable things at a rate slightly faster than unemployment. And so over time, and most of the jobs that they invent are better jobs with better salaries, with better conditions. I also believe, by the way, that humans are right at the edge. Your generation will probably, on average, live to be over 100. And, they'll be, and you'll be much healthier. I mean, 100 for your generation will probably be about 60 for your grandparents. It'll be that big a difference. Partly because, historically, people were worn out physically. I mean, you, you work in a steel mill, you plow behind a mule, you just physically get worn down. Uh, most of us nowadays, may, you may exercise, but that's a volitional thing. It's not, you know, you're not, you're not being burned out. And so people are going to live longer. I, I was with Henry Kissinger recently, who's now 95. And he works full time and would be bored to death. I mean, if you said to Henry, we're going to make you retire, he just would be bored to death. He'd think we were crazy. Uh, so you're going, to have you're going to have people who live longer. They're going to have greater range of options. And it, I think it requires really rethinking two profound things. One is, how do we build, and this is why I like Udacity as a model for you to look at, we have to build online convenient learning systems and mentoring systems that allow you to learn conveniently. So, I mean, if you want to go to uh, Bali for six weeks and take your courses online, I don't care. You know, I don't think you have to go to a campus somewhere, be available the two hours a week the professor's available. Um, I, mean, I mean, think about how inefficient the current structures are. Um, and then second, I think you've got to rethink the finances. I, I was... Uh, talking to a relative of mine who's thinking about he may retire from the company he's been with for 25 years. And I said, do you have a pension? He said, no. He said, they never had a pension. Their system is to have a 401k that they match. So he actually has a pretty large amount of money in his 401k. And I think you've got to, you'll, we'll have to be thinking in terms of each of you on average will have five to seven or more jobs in your lifetime. I mean, career kind of jobs. I don't just mean internships and what have you. And so you got to think about how are you going to change? How are you going to evolve? And I've, I've, I've reinvented myself four or five times. I mean, you know, and, and people will just learn to do that. that that's my guess. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Newt, I have an idea for your next book. Okay. And I think you are probably the, the most qualified to handle this, but uh, it could be a Donald Trump's guide to creatively handling the ever-changing nature of world events and you could use a system of computers to have all the infinite number of possibilities of events that can be taking place at any given time and you're given a problem and it's your this is a reader participation thing it's your um, job as a reader to come up with the most viable way of handling this problem and have a system of grading it so that you can weed out all those who could should never run for president in the well of course under our rules and i happen to think they're legitimate uh, anybody can run for president who has the guts to do it and the american people get to weed them out uh, and they don't do it because of some rational you know process they do it because they intuit in the end you know who has the makings to be president uh, although you make me think it would be fun to invent a game that was basically be your own president where there would be a whole series of crises and uh, the Reagan Library has done this. The, the Reagan Library uh, takes the Grenada operation and actually takes students in and puts them in, uh, in the situation room and says you're now going to get the information they got you're, and you have to make the decision, you have to think it through and that's a pretty good uh, ground rule. Yes, sir. Hold on. Hold on. He's coming right up. I think I got a signal from. 
<laughs> uh, Mitchell Sanders, College of the Ozarks. Um, so you touched a bit on kind of uh, conservative fiscal policy and, and conservative attitude toward government deregulation. Um, and I think uh, a, a larger portion of America is starting to agree with you on that. However, I think um, a lot a lot of people, the beef they have with conservatism is the social policy. I mean, especially my generation, I think a lot of people consider themselves um, conservative fiscally, but more liberal socially. What do you think conservatism needs to do to kind of combat that and, and to adapt to that? Well, I, th I think it, it works itself out, and I think it works itself out in different ways. I mean, I think on the one front, you could argue that the whole question, for example, of, of uh, gay marriage has moved, particularly in your generation, towards what we could call the left. On the other hand, I would suggest to you that abortion has actually moved to the right, and that the development of technologies that allow you to see the baby at an earlier and earlier date has just had a devastating effect on the acceptability of abortion, particularly after the first 20, week, 20 weeks. So these things come in, you know, they're, they're, it's a more complicated pattern, I think. But I also think, you know, sometimes you, you, you build a majority around the issues that you can rally a majority on. And you, part of the art of politics is to focus on the ones you win on uh, and not focus on the ones you lose on. And uh, I help. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of as a speaker, uh, I helped write the only four balanced budgets in your lifetime. And I think we, we'll get back to that. I think, I think there are ways to do it that are very real. And I'm actually going to do a series of online uh, course, short courses on uh, how to balance the budget and, and how to get back to this sort of thing. Because I think the country is getting ripe for sort of reclaiming control of its destiny. Uh, and being pretty honest about what we have to get done. So I think it's exciting. Well, I, I think I'm going to get the hook in a minute. So let, let me just say, go back to where we started. I, I think the Young Americas Foundation is important. I think it's important because we badly need people like yourselves who are willing to learn conservatism, debate conservatism, uh, and stand up uh, on campuses and later on stand up in newsrooms and stand up in other settings. And I think that. Uh, uh, in the long run, I think reality gives us a very high likelihood of winning this, this running argument with the left. Uh, but I think it takes people like yourselves who are willing to do the work and make the arguments and have the courage to stand up. So I'm honored to be here, and I thank you for letting me talk with you.